We uh, are shows what you know. We'll always watch TV. And if you think we can't, we'll watch more and you'll see. That's why the people of the web believe in Jim from Las Vegas, Sam, Jacob from Sweden. Shows what you know, your television podcast. Welcome, everyone. I am Jim from Las Vegas. And I'm Jacob from Sweden, and welcome back to another Shows What You Know, where we will be discussing some news, what we've been watching, and of course, the Penguin Season 1, Episode 05. Now, if you're an eagle-eared listener, you might notice a slight extra extra echo in my on my end, and that's because I'm sitting in the most nondescript room you've ever seen. It's freshly painted in here, but what color? You're going to have to go to youtube.com slash shows what you know to find out. But yeah, I painted this room very recently. And if I'm more incoherent than usual, I'm blaming it on the fumes. I was going to say, you getting that good high? Getting that good good? Hell yeah. Um, well, I also I also have some smelly candles in here, which I'm hoping will make me not poisoned. I don't know. <laughs> I, cl- I, I will say I would die for my art where just before we hit record, I close the window. I'm like, well, we can't have, can't have sounds from outside coming uh, in. So. And now I'm ar- already regretting it. But yeah, here we are again. Yes. Well, as you said, news, television news, although, you know, something we talk about a lot is like the blurred lines now between movies and TV, especially with streaming and movies that go directly to streaming and spinoffs of movies that are now television shows or movies that are spinoff from TV shows. There's been uh, New York Comic Con went on this past weekend uh, and to the public, they released the Karate Kid Legends poster. For people that don't know Karate Kid Legends, um, you're like, oh, isn't it, you mean the show Cobra Kai? Well, yeah, well, there's a little little known fact. Uh, Cobra Kai actually was a continuation of the Karate Kid films from the 80s. Talk to your parents <laughs> about them, kids. They'll tell you about it. But Cobra Kai wasn't just a show. It was also a movie. Now, what? that movie also had its own reboot, remake. It, was, it wasn't a reboot. It was a remake with Jackie Chan. And um, uh, is it Jaden Smith? Yeah, What's his I name? believe so. Yeah, all right. Yeah, that yeah, sounds Jackie right. Chan Who cares? And, yeah, Jackie Chan and Will Smith's son. So yeah. that was a reboot. It didn't have Mr. Miyagi. It didn't have Daniel. didn't have Johnny Lawrence. didn't even have Miguel. And now, I haven't seen it <laughs> since 2010 <laughs> when it came out. But as far yeah. as I recall, it fucking sucked because I've, there was no Mr. Miyagi. There was no... Uh, you liked it? We never talked I, about this. We've talked about every Karate Kid movie, even the Hillary Swank one, every episode of yeah. Cobra Kai. I didn't know you liked the Jackie Chan Karate Kid. No, you cut me off. I've never seen it. I've never Ooh. even... They, which is, I think we talked about probably... Because again, yes, as you said, we watched all the Karate Kid films. We've discussed every episode of Cobra Kai. And we I'd never seen the Hillary Swank one until we watched it for the show. But I've yet to see the Jackie Chan Karate Kid. But anyways, I mean, for the longest time, or at least from the producers of Cobra Kai, they always talk about the Miyagi-verse. And, you know, they, we've brought back people from the movies. We've brought back... Uh, uh, God damn, wh- who's the bully guy again? Why am I spacing on his name? Oh, Mike Barnes. You know, we've brought back the old skeleton crew of the Cobra Kai. We, we've seen all these people. We're still wondering if Hillary Swank's going to show up. But the question was always like, well, will we see Jackie Chan? And they would always say, that's not the Miyagi-verse. That's a reboot. That's not connected. Now, this movie goes, it goes against that grain. And, I, and apparently the producers of Cobra Kai are not involved in this at all, from what I'm reading. But this mm. movie is putting daniel San and Mr. Han. Come on. Mr. Han, which is Jackie Chan's character from the reboot, together for a new Karate Kid in Karate Kid Legends. And that's basically the poster's not, like, you know, super uh, awesome or anything. You know, you just see you see the two floating heads of Jackie Chan and uh, 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 Ralph Macchio. And then we get our new Karate Kid, which apparently they did some sort of na- nationwide search Uh, People were submitting videos or something, or everyone was submitting their tryouts. Just so happened to be a kid that was already an actor that they picked. (laughs) You know how funny Mm. how that works. Um, uh, Who was it? Ben uh, Ben Wang. So you got them on the poster. It's coming out May 30th. 
But they also did show a trailer to the audience at, at, at New York Comic Con because the big burning question, at least for me, is how connected or is this a completely separate thing uh, where they're just kind of – because when you start building in TV show baggage, it starts to turn off people. Like, you know, you have to take into account who – what about the people that never watched Cobra Kai but are familiar with Karate Kid? But then again, it's like, well, what about the people that only know Cobra Kai and don't know Karate Kid? So what's that balancing act they're going to do? Plus, Cobra Kai is not done yet. They haven't announced – an actual date yet for the third part of this like mini season trilogy they're doing. We got part two is coming up in a couple weeks here on November 15th. They've just said 2025. So I wonder, are they vague because potentially this could lead in or that would, that would be the dream, Jim. That would be the dream. If there's actual like crossover and stuff, we have to assume that's not going to be the case. And as I said, right before we started recording, the thing that would just, infuriate me is if they needlessly like retconned uh you know the the whole plot of cobra kai the show out Mm. of the movie universe if they're if daniel san is there and he's just like me well i haven't done karate in 30 years or whatever and you're (laughs) like no but you're you're you would have you would have been in cobra kai by now like they, they don't even need johnny lawrence in there like obviously ideally we would like to see a bit of connective tissue and it's a fucking hell of a coincidence that they're both coming out at the same time but i feel like if they were tied together they would lean on that more or at least like not meant like not hide it you know but then that would make for an awesome cameo it's the type of thing that's something that's more well organized than the miyagi verse would probably do which is why i feel like it's not happening but yeah, maybe they are keeping it vague on purpose, though, because it is like, oh, at the end of the season, you know, they're like, we did it. We 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 wrapped up everyone's story. And then they're like, Daniel, there's someone at the door for you. And then it's Jackie fucking Chan. <laughs> and then it ends, you know, but they have to I'd spoil okay the that. ending. <laughs> they have to yeah. s- kind of spoil the ending because of synergy. And you can't not promote this film. Uh, that's mm. coming out. I do know that they wanted this movie to come out this past summer because it was what the fortieth, yeah, fortieth anniversary uh, would have mm. been was is this year twenty twenty four. But obviously, you know, with the strikes and all that shit, like yeah, things changed. Um, so, but then again, it's it's also like, did they just throw this together because like, hey, oh, you know what's kind of popular? Cobra Kai is kind of popular, and actually, we're coming up on a fortieth anniversary of this thing we own. Let's do a new thing about it. Uh, So, yeah, that's the push and pull of me where it's like I'm excited for this, but I hate myself that I'm excited for it because I'm like, you shouldn't be excited. This is what they want. Now, Mm. I've been trying to read. uh, Go ahead before I get into it. I was just going to say, I I don't hate you, Jim. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Thank you. I appreciate it. Mm. I've been trying to read breakdowns of the trailer, but, like, I can't tell what's what. Because like Collider, yeah, this is one of those bullshit things where we don't get to see the trailer. We'll yes. prob- I mean, I'm sure we'll talk about it here when it's out, but yeah. Yes. So Collider, the way they describe it. Um, no, it, it's, maybe it's not Collider. No, it's comic book resources, which or CBR, which which are hacks like. Uh, okay. So I can't trust them. But the way they describe the the trailer is they're like, where is it? Let me go back here. Yeah, it shows Mr. Han, played by Jackie Chan, visiting Daniel LaRusso's Miyagi-Do. Mr. Mm-hmm. Han then recruits Daniel to help him train the next karate kid, Lee Fong, played by Bang, Ben Wang. But, like, and then Yahoo has a breakdown of that, except Yahoo uses, like, the exact same. Yahoo looks like they copied and pasted this, or they've copied and pasted this from Yahoo. But then when you go to, like, Collider, they don't mention that... You know, mi- we see a yeah. shot of Mr. Han going to Miyagi Do. Because if Miyagi Do's there, then we are led to believe that, yes, okay, they're probably not going to directly get into specifics from Cobra Kai, but at least there's a small, you know, tip of the cap of like, hey, yes, this is a continuation of what we've seen with Cobra Kai. We're not going to get too into the weeds um, because if you just watch the movies, you could just assume, ah, eh, Daniel continued the the legacy of Mr. Miyagi, you know what I mean? You don't need to really know the specifics. 
Are they going to so like, use the the set though? Like the set's right there. Surely they would yes. just use the same set. It, in which case, there is a connective tissue, you know. No, exactly. It'll be. I don't know if you've seen like. Uh, have you seen or even remember Deadpool two? I've seen it. Do I remember it? I well, there's a there's a funny joke they have like that's like this almost where they're you know they're in the X mansion. And Deadpool's like, where, like, you know, why is it only Colossus? Like, there should be oh, yeah. more. Like, I should see the rest of them. And they open yeah. one door, and like, they happen to be filming, I think, Days of Futures Past. So they're able to shoot this quick thing where you see every X Men in the room, but he doesn't see. Yeah. And then they quickly close the door. Like, I picture one of those moments where, yeah, like, you know, Jackie Chan knocks on the door, uh, Daniel opens it, you see everyone behind him. You see. Miguel, you see friggin' um goddamn what's uh Johnny's son's name? Uh I've I've forgotten all the characters already. You see yeah, you, s- you see Samantha LaRusso, you see you see LaPusso, you see all of them. Robbie? Uh yeah, Robbie. Tori, there you go. Yeah. Eli's there. He's, yeah, they're all oh. in the background, and then he, and he quickly but he does like the half open door thing, like Daniel's yeah. and then he's like, Oh, excuse me, everyone, and then he like slide. <laughs> slightly gets out and closes the door we never see them yeah. again um it's a good but prediction. i can't yeah i can't tell because cbr stuff reads like ai wrote it so i don't know if mm. ai just assumed if you're like hey I, ai what would a karate kid sequel look like and they would be like well cobra kai's a thing right now so mr han would go and recruit daniel from the uh from the miyagi do dojo now right. one could be how they wrote the script also <laughs> One kind of red flag, I mean, again, th- for people that don't know that we host a Cobra Kai show and we're, like, obsessed with Cobra Kai, like, yeah. nitpicking things that I'm going off of third-hand information. I'm just, like, sucking at morsels of information. <laughs> You're the a real breakdown, Cobra Kai kid over there. <laughs> yeah. The breakdown of the trailer, it keeps talking about all the fights they're showing, and it's like, all right, red flag. Uh, guess what, Karate Kid movies? They're not about the fucking fights. I mean, I guess maybe the second one is because they fight to the death. But the whole fucking point is that Mr. Miyagi doesn't want you to fight. So if you're doing this trailer where everyone's like, whoopah, 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 all that shit, even though, yes, Cobra Kai has that, but that's not what these movies are supposed to be about. It's not supposed to be a big fucking mirage uh, or montage of uh, people doing cool karate shit. Okay, first of all, I love your belligerence. Uh, I want you to hold on to that. That's how yeah. we make more podcasts. And secondly, it's still just a trailer, Jim. You know, people got annoyed. Sure. I was discussing yeah. the Gladiator trailer um, on Real History. People got annoyed about, like, the rap music being in the trailer. And I was like, has anyone, not, not my co-host, just everyone on the internet. And I was like, has anyone seen a trailer before? Jim, you know they're going to put fights in the trailer. And especially True. if it's an early trailer where maybe they don't want to give away the plot, maybe you just see some clips of fights and things you know yeah yeah you're right because if they are they are keeping things kind of vague um what is interesting is um the director uh the director is the director from the this show that we really like the end of the fucking world uh oh. which i thought was kind of cool i didn't realize that until this week when i was mm. looking into it a little bit more um he also did a show called I Am Not Okay With This. I forget if I watched that or not, but I definitely remember uh, The End of the Fucking World. We actually discussed that show, and we both we both liked it. Yeah, yeah, we actually have that on um, on showsgeno.com. You can find it there as well, yeah. Uh, interesting. And he worked... Uh, sorry, I'm just Googling him frantically now to find some more details. But let me tell you one uh, quick thing. The... N- 2010 uh, Karate Kid film, it did make money, you know? So we're talking about, oh, are they making this because Cobra Kai is successful or whatever? That film made money, and it's been 14 years, which in today's society is more than twice as long as you need to do, like, a reboot or a sequel or whatever. Um, So I think they got a Mm -hmm. good good bit of synergy. Now, I've been on a bit of a Jackie Chan tip recently. Maybe I didn't love the original Karate Kid, or, sorry, the original, the the new Karate Kid, uh, sorry, although I think that's uh, the Hillary Swank one. Maybe I didn't like the Jackie Chan Karate Kid film that much, but I do like Jackie Chan. And I recently rewatched Police Story, and I was like, "Oh, what other Jackie Chan film can I watch?" Um, and I just flicked on one um, that's called Armor of God. And the first thing on there is like a big warning of like. 
this film was made in a time that's different from uh, now, and uh, <laughs> of course, there yeah. may be some references and some things that would not be considered okay. We we have decided to leave this film as it was originally made, and I was like, oh, interesting. I wonder if I'll be able to tell what it is that is referring to. And the very first scene, <laughs> I shit you not, it cuts directly to like a tribe in Africa. And I think that's all I need to say on the topic. It's it's because oh, okay. it, Jackie Chan plays a treasure hunter in this, like an Indiana mm-hmm. Jones type character. And he's going adventuring around the world. And he's also in a cool band, uh, very much in <laughs> a, a Hong Kong type film. And he, um, yeah, I'm not going to go into detail, but I was immediately like, yep, that com- immediately confirmed that that was a correct <laughs> warning to put there. And I was like, because genuinely I was flicking through Jackie Chan films and I was like, Armor of God, I wonder why I've never heard of this one. <laughs> and I flicked <laughs> and I'm like, oh no, <laughs> oh no, Jackie. <laughs> so that was Wasn't an aside, but anyway, I uh, didn't actually finish it. Uh, ah, so okay. there might be even more racist stuff in there I didn't even get to. So but that knows? could mean anything. Jake, like, cause some people would hear that and be like, oh, well, you didn't finish it. That means it's not good. Jacob does that shit all the time. Like, yeah. stuff he likes even. He won't finish. Like, he'll be watching a TV show. He won't finish an episode and then pick back up five episodes later and just be like, all right. Oh, I guess things happened. I get the idea. <laughs> I get the general mm. idea. Yeah, I know. You hate it. Uh, mm. do, do it mostly to piss you off, Jim. Um, yeah. But we're, most, we're, we're definitely looking forward to this Karate Kid film. We're looking forward to some Cobra Kai discussions coming up next month. So if you're not up to date on Cobra Kai, get on that. We're clearly going to get into it. Um, but yeah, Jim, do we have anything else? Well, I just wanted to say, well, Sorry. still before we move on from this... Um, yeah. So, of course, Mr. Han does reveal, at least in one of these reports, that he did know Mr. Miyagi. And I I can't, it's not the movie's fault. It's just because Cobra Kai does this so much. Like, I can't help but roll my eyes of how they're always retconning, like, the connections of, you know, Mr. Like, in this recent batch of episodes, there was the whole, the whole hidden chest under his bed. Like, you always have to figure out all these little, you know, little twists and turns in this man's past. I guess no one man can be fully explained in one film so i get it like that's not the all-encompassing mr miyagi but it's just hilarious to me that it's always something he, he this guy knew everyone he did everything he lived a full life and i wouldn't have it any other way um i guess we do hear daniel mentioning two branches from one tree before the trailer smash cuts to multiple fighting sequences. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> um, I mean, that's funny because, as you said, the Jackie Chan movie is a remake, so he is Mr. Miyagi. Like, they renamed him yeah. Han, but, like, he's supposed yeah. to be Mr. Miyagi. Also, I guess one thing of note, there's no karate in the Jackie Chan Karate Kid film. It's all kung fu, so that's just something to bear in mind. Yeah. We'll see what, what type of uh, <laughs> fighting they do in this upcoming one. Uh, they so should have yeah, just yeah. called what it the else? Kung Fu Kid and ha- and do like a remake with the same plot, but have it be Kung Fu. But anyway, that's not how franchises yeah. work. That would be perfect. Um, yeah. Well, so yeah, what if else? I actually oh. have a, a piece of uh, news here, there you're a bit of a horror buff, Jim. Yes, yes, I am. Yeah. So, uh, reported in Variety this week, ca- there's a Carrie TV show in the works at Amazon uh, by none other than Mike Flanagan himself, who, I mean, I've seen some of his things and really like them, but I believe you and everyone who's into horror films is a big fan of Mike Flanagan, right? Yes, because now I know, like, w- the first part of your s- that sentence, the first part of their announcement when you're bringing that up, I'm like, shut the fuck up! Like, Carrie, Carrie TV... So- yes, exactly. Yeah. Carrie TV show. We've already seen a remake. Yes, the movie's classic, the book's classic, uh, but the original, I should say. Um, so initially, it's like, shut up. Shut up, Jacob. I'll strangle you. I'll kill you. Uh, yeah. But then <laughs> when you throw in Mike Flanagan, like, it changes everything. You could you could announce the biggest horse shit, but if you tell me that Mike Flanagan's involved, I'm like, all right, because this guy cares about stuff. I like his writing. I like... I like his view on horror. Um, he he's very much like someone that puts heart and sensitivity into his horror, especially his creatures or his monsters. Um, I mean, did you watch? I I was watching clips of it this week on social media. You ever get caught up like just watching clips from a show you've watched before? Sometimes. Mm-hmm. 
Because uh, oh, yeah. I, I don't know if you've watched Midnight Mass. I've only watched it once, but people were sharing clips probably because people are watching it for the spooky season. And I was like, this is a fucking damn good show. Like, I need to rewatch this again. And I know, like, some people can complain a bit. He does get a little wordy with his monologues. It It, it is like he's like almost too precious for our time where he's very sentimental and he's not afraid to do that. So, you know, in this, this world of irony that we live in where like you can't have in most projects, you can't really have like real moments. Like it has to be like uh undercut by some sort of meta joke slash spinoff yeah. slash Easter egg or whatever. And he does blame do Joss that. Whedon. <laughs> yeah. But Joss Whedon perfected it. It's just, it's the bad copycats of Joss Whedon. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he wears his heart on his sleeve while also keeping things scary and terrifying because he also is working on an Exorcist uh, movie because they just we just last year we saw a terrible uh, launch of an Exorcist trilogy that completely fell flat on its face that they had to scramble <laughs> and get Mike Flanagan involved. So it's yeah. again uh, the only thing that's like oh okay that'll be cool. So yeah, with this, I mean, not that Carrie's even that. Uh, it's not really a project or an IP, I guess, to be kind of insulting. It's not an IP that's close to my heart or anything like that. I don't even know if I've seen the original movie. I mean, I know enough of it just of living in the world. Um, Man, I've seen even I've seen the original movie of that, Jim. Wow, that's crazy. Well, you got for me. a horror film. Yeah, I know <laughs> I've seen bits and pieces of it, but like, yeah, it was just one of those where by the time I was old enough to like watch movies, I already knew kind of the gist. Yeah. So I was just like, yeah, whatever. Um, I think I but watched anyways. it like late night TV where it was randomly on. I didn't even know what I was watching because it was like before <laughs> you had the flicking through the channels. It'll tell you yes. what it is kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> and I just watched it. And then it was and I was like, what is happening in this film? And then like <laughs> the ending happened. I was like, what the absolute fuck? So I might not have seen the beginning of it, but <laughs> I hadn't read the book, obviously, or knew what it was at the time. I was too young. Uh, but yeah, Mike Flanagan, if you don't know the name, I mean, he's kind of become the guy or at least one of the main guys in, in horror media production right like he he's if you don't know the name you've still definitely seen some of his things on your netflix even if you haven't watched it you've seen the haunting yeah. hill house on there you've seen the fall of the house of usher and you yep. know the list goes on from from all the productions he's made in the last few years but but would you say he's the guy when it comes to like is he the, it, when it comes to horror anyway you you find out he's involved and you're like fuck yeah and is yeah, there anyone on that level Especially for me personally, absolutely. Um, mm. Between, yeah, like his Netflix stuff, which Netflix, he, this is for Amazon because like last year or a year ago, year and a half ago, whatever, he kind of f- filled his contract and I guess they let him go or With Amazon Netflix offered him. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, Netflix, because Amazon must have offered him more or something. Um, but even like, he, because he's also, he's not afraid to kind of touch these uh hallowed horror properties because he also made dr sleep which is essentially a sequel to the shining Mm -hmm. and he successfully makes both a sequel to the movie which famously stephen king does not like um and the book he says the book is very different but dr sleep serves as a sequel to both the movie and the book at least from my understanding i haven't read the original book but like Mm-hmm. It it works on both levels. Even the extended cut's really good. Um, he also made the movie Gerald's Game, although that was, I think, for Netflix as well. He made this movie Oculus, which is about a haunted mirror, which sounds so stupid, but it's such a good movie. He did a... There was a, a stupid cash grab horror movie about Ouija boards that came out in like the mid-2000s, and he did a prequel sequel to it, which by all accounts should be terrible, but it's very good. Yeah, like for me especially, I know I think uh, I think most people uh, that are big in horror probably have a lot of respect for him. But absolutely, if I see his name attached to something, he hasn't failed me yet. Cool. And he's uh, done some Stephen King adaptations before, like you said, like a few and seems to be working okay. So it kind of makes sense. Now, of course, this is early news. This is just like we've just found out that it's like in development. Right. But I feel like the fact that, you know, Flanagan has an overall deal with Amazon it feels like he's a big enough name and Stephen King's a big enough name that, you know, this is a pretty credible thing for us to be reporting on this early on because many of these things just go away, you know? But I feel like he's tied to Amazon. 
Am- if Amazon has the rights to carry, why would they not want to make a carry TV show? So it definitely feels like something that's going to come out. Uh, you know, maybe it'll be a number of years like it often is, but it uh, feels like something that's going to happen. Yes, yeah. And he works rather quickly, too. So even if he's working on The Exorcist, like... I mean, for, for Netflix, he was pretty steady. If maybe It might not have been every Halloween season, but it was almost like every other Halloween season, he would have a new show. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, he does have a movie coming out this upcoming year as well called The Life of Chuck with Tom Hiddleston, which has been getting really great uh, responses uh, playing at festivals. So a lot, of stu- a lot of great Flanagan stuff in the pipeline. You love to see it. Yeah. Uh, oh, there already was a TV film remake in 2002 of Carrie as well. I didn't even realize that. I did see the Chloe Moretz 2020. It's weird. I have seen the 2013 one, but I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> Here I am st- stating I'm a horror fan, but I don't. I'm like, ah, I haven't seen <laughs> Carrie. I've seen. Oh, the one with Chloe Moretz? Yeah, of course. I've seen it. Yeah, I've seen Cobra Kai. Who's Mr. <laughs> Miyagi? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who is that? <laughs> you mean the sh- Johnny Lawrence show? Yeah. <laughs> Um, I mean, I guess should we just get into what we've been watching? Yeah, yeah. What TV shows have you been watching? Let me start it up here. Let me serve it up with a double dose of reality TV, my dudes. Woo! To to the surprise of no one, horror <laughs> and reality. That's all I watch. Um, which is the I polar <laughs> opposite where, uh, except for Great British Bake Off, which is obviously yeah. a horror show, um, I'm the complete opposite. Neither, <laughs> not a very interested in either of those genres. And so that's why we're a perfect question mark fit. <laughs> now, I did watch, uh, I guess this has been on for a couple weeks now, and I think it's originally a New Zealand show that's now here in America, The Summit. Uh, I don't know how international it is. Maybe it's in other countries as well. But it's essentially Survivor on a mountain, but climbing a mountain. They have a, it's like a group of like 20 people or something like that. And they all start like down on the ground and they they have a million bucks that they split up in all their packs. And they get mm-hmm. this mission like you have 14 days to get everyone to the summit of this mountain. And like you pick a leader or whoever, here's a map. There's some checkpoints laid out. Uh, throughout the path and uh, again if you don't make it in 14 days you get nothing if uh, if someone quits they get nothing and their money goes with them like however much money you have in your pack as it's like broken up um, mm-hmm. and I'm kind of, so far I'm in like in the first episode there's already a guy that basically like just collapses like you know that we show his we show his inspirational story which is nice you know he was a guy he was he used to be like 400 pounds or something like that, and he had a kid and changed his outlook on life. He lost a ton of weight, but he was still like 260 or something. And so as they're hiking up this mountain, all of a sudden, like his eyes go crazy and he falls over. And they're like, "Well, you know, here comes the helicopter. <laughs> you got to go, and your money's going with you. Uh, you lost a bunch of money for the team. Uh, he gets medevaced out, and the group." already starts with it this is like within a day it's already kind of like human nature you're breaking up in little tribes because it's like mm-hmm. hey the fit people we're up front we're making good time we have to keep waiting for these older fatter people in the back and now it's like what are we going to do because there's a point where they um they get these little like mini challenges like at this one point they have to cross this ravine and there's like a rope in the like a, a really flimsy rope bridge and they have to do it like pick a partner and they have to like hold on to each other and like shimmy across it i mean obviously they have safety lines attached to them and shit like yeah. that but there's an odd person out so they're like well you can either uh leave them behind uh or uh you know offer them there's here's a tool where you could get them across um and it's like, but if you leave them behind, this is, it's Bo. Bo's this older, older guy, and he's been holding up the team the whole time. But it, they're still kind of, some people are like, well, maybe we should leave them. But they're still like, you know what? Nah, come on, Bo. Let's go. They bring Bo with them. But then when you get to your checkpoint, you have to vote someone out anyways. Right. So now it comes down to, like, who do we want to keep? Who's our numbers? And it starts playing like that. And I can imagine it's only going to get 
a little bit more cutthroat. When you vote someone out, their money doesn't go. You just take the money. Say, when you vote someone out, you kick them off the mountain. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, there's a mo- in in the second episode. I mean, if someone's gonna watch us, I won't spoil who it is, but they get to the point where again they're crossing another rickety bridge. But mm-hmm. the first guy, they're like, you got to pick someone to go first and make sure you trust them. And the first guy that goes first, they 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 call it like the 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 god of the mountain or something. It's just a helicopter. They're like, oh, or the eyes of the mountain is always watching. And it's the helicopter. And the helicopter will come around every now and then and drop something down. And it drops this pack. And it's like, you pick the next person to go. They pick the next person. But whoever's last, you have to take this axe and chop the bridge while they're on it. (laughs) (laughs) And the way it's edited, it's edited as if the person died. Because you see him. Hunger Games. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Go on. (laughs) Because they they can't even just say, hey, you're last. We're not taking you. You got to stay. They're like, no, you have to call him over and wait until he's on the bridge, and then you have to cut it. And, yeah, he has a safety line, but it's like he's like, I'm coming, guys. And they're like, yeah, it, they're like, yeah, okay. And he's like, oh, this is great. I'm coming. And then the other guy has to take the axe out, and you see him chop it, and then you just see the poor guy just starting to fall. And it's, But they never cut back to see him hanging <laughs> from the safety line. So it's, it's edited as if, like, nope, he's dead. He's dead now. And we're on our way. <laughs> okay. This is why I watch the Great British Bake Off, Jim. The worst thing that can happen there is that Noel Fielding accidentally tips over someone's caramel. Uh, but yeah. Nelly was okay. Don't worry. Uh, they show her remake the caramel. Uh, this sounds great, Jim. It sounds like actual Hunger Games. Um, yeah. And, but it's funny that it's that extreme already where it's mm. like, we're, it's not only like, we're going to let... You know, we're, we have a competitive element, and we're gonna let things fester between the compet. No, it's like you need to cut the bridge while someone's on the <laughs> bridge. They're really like putting a bunch of flies in a jar and shaking it around and throwing it yeah. off this mountain. Uh, you gotta love it. People go to real extremes. Um, well, do you gotta love it? I don't know. I don't know if it's you for gotta me, love it. You gotta love well, it. Cause I do love. I do love that they edit it so that you don't see the person swinging because it's like yeah. reality TV, baby. Yeah. <laughs> you know no, they lived, dead. but also imagine if he didn't. <laughs> yeah, just think of him. He might as well be dead at this point. He's dead. Imagine not knowing like what's gonna happen when you start crossing the bridge. You see someone with an axe on the other <laughs> side and start cutting. Does, you don't. You're not thinking it's okay. I have a safety line. You're like I spent. Months of my life leading up to this. Yes. <laughs> like, yes. I've been preparing. I uh, have taken time off work. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> Dude, and it's so funny because um, they, like, yeah, they. it's the last two people waiting to see who's going to get called next. And they're both kind of talking, chatting each other up. And they're like, you know what? I'll see you on the other side. Like, if you, you wait for me, you're going to give me a big hug. And when the last person goes, <laughs> the last person gets there, and then they tell them, they're like, you have to call him over, but we have to cut the bridge. And they just start crying. They're like, I said it was going to hug me. What did he got here? <laughs> and they have to, like, compose themselves and be like, all right, come on. <laughs> Get over here. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, and I mean, it, it also, I mean, it is impressive because, yeah, they're going like vertical up some of these these hiking trails and stuff like that. And this is, again, just kind of the beginning. So it is like physically it does look very demanding. And then the host will show up every now and then like they must fly him in because he'll walk up and be like, guys, you're not making great time. You're not going to make camp. You're not by this point. He's, you need to start thinking about what you're going to do with your team if you think you're going to make that summit within 14 days and that puts even more pressure on like who, who do we get rid of do we have to like go to our alliances like there's these uh there's like a mommy alliance like all these like moms kind of bonded together but mm. then it's like ooh but who's going with the numbers and going against the mommy alliance you never know but yeah i'm two episodes in i think three have aired uh that's the summit uh Sounds the great. american version anyways from my understand it takes place in new zealand and when i looked it up it looked like they've already had a season or two um in new zealand so it's great because it is like lord of the rings style like a lot of they get these helicopter shots it literally just looks like they're walking to mordor because it's like probably the same mountains and valleys they're in yeah it's basically as if uh (laughs) 
it's basically if uh, Gandalf was going across the <laughs> Minas Morgul bridge or whatever, and then <laughs> Frodo has to call him over, and, and he actually fucks up the Balrog, and he's walking back. The whip misses him, and Frodo has to like fucking yeah. take his axe, to, or Gimli has to take his axe to the bridge, and he's fucked. Yeah, uh, Frodo has to stab him with Sting and just push him down after the Balrog so, yeah, with tears yeah. in his eyes. Technically um, alive. He'll come back later, but yeah. yeah, it's pretty disturbing nonetheless. He'll come back better than ever. Uh, yeah. And then I might as well keep them together here. Uh, I've also been watching House of Villains season two. Mm. Um, House of Villains is an E Channel reality show, which is very tongue in cheek. It's very meta because it is taking some of the most infamous names from reality TV and putting them in a house together where they have little challenges and competitions of their own, um, and they vote people out for, yeah, of course, a cash prize. And, you know, I watched the first season because Johnny Bananas from The Challenge was on it. Now Wes from The Challenge is on season two. Joel McHale hosts it, so that kind of gives you the vibe. Like, the the show's edited in in a tongue-in-cheek way. They know it's ridiculous. Um but they bring in, like, I don't know if you're familiar with, like, I Love New York, which was, like, the Flavor Fla- or flavor of Love New York was a character on that. And then she became, I was like, like, yeah, Jim, it's a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She became, like, a character of her, of her own. She was on season one. She's back in season two. There's a lot of people I don't know who they are. Like, I don't want, like, again, I'm, I'm I, the shows yeah. which you know, reality connoisseur, but I don't, I'm not that deep. There are some people I have no idea who they are. But uh, I it's believe a fun you told watch. me this it's, before, it's possibly. But but sorry to cut you off. I, but I, I believe you told no, me you about did. the show before. But like, tell me again, what did they do on the show? What happens when you're while you're watching the show? They're not because the so summit they, I like. I like the concept of like you're climbing yeah. a mountain. I'm like clear goal. It makes sense. This thing. Are they in a house? Are they on a beach? They're in a house. What is the plot? Okay. They're in a house. This is basically for people that are fans of reality TV because they're in a house. They'll bring in other infamous villains from other reality shows will come in to give them some sort of challenge they have to do. Usually it's really silly. It's not like the show. The challenge gets kind of athletic, like it's real competitions. This is like they were on Hollywood Boulevard trying to get people's signatures. Whoever got the most signature would be safe. Like that type. It's like goofy shit. Right. So yeah. you have like someone from RuPaul's Drag Race, and then you have Richard Hatch, the winner of the first season of Sur- Survivor. So a lot of times they're just bullshitting because they're also aware of like, I'm a villain, so I play up my attitude for yeah. these shows anyways. But. They are big personalities, so the idea is there are moments where they start yelling at each other, whether that be because they're actually uh, arguing or they know they're going to get scream time. That's kind of up for debate where they get into these big arguments, but they're building alliances like, hey, we'll team up. Let's vote this person out. Let's let's pull this person in, vote them out. It's it's similar to Survivor, Big Brother, these other shows, but in a much lighter tongue in cheek goofier way because it's supposed to be all these villains and it's like you get the biggest villains together um will they team up or will they implode like that type of deal so they do silly shit that's that's really it it's 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 something that i throw on like oh i'm on my lunch break i'll throw something on that i can half pay attention to um so it's i can't like fully recommend it unless you're into reality tv because you kind of even though i only know like two people you need to at least know a couple people to like have someone to root for almost. Yeah, yeah. Although it was kind of funny. They had a 90-day fiancé. I'm not sure if you're aware of that show. Um, I've never it's watched like it. All, it's like all the other ones, isn't it? Like yeah. all the marriage ones seem like a very similar flavor to me. You well, either this one, get f- engaged or married or you can't see each other or, you know, whatever. This right? one is, is a little bit more particularly American because it's like I've never watched it. I've only heard a lot about it. Because the conceit is, like, loser guys bring, like, you know, like, hot women from other countries. And it's, like, will they stay married so they get citizenship? Like, that's kind of Right, what, okay, okay. And it's, okay. like, are these girls using these loser guys? So they had this 90-day fiancé chick who's got these big, like, balloon tits, <laughs> for lack of a better description. Sure, and, yeah. And when they're doing the get signatures on Hollywood Boulevard, like, you know, the dragways 
queen is just coasting off of like, hey, I'm in, you, how could you not pay attention to me? I'm in this extravagant drag thing, plus I'm well-known on RuPaul's Drag Race. People are recognizing and signing. And uh, someone else from The Bachelorette, so they're just like coasting off their celebrity. The 90 Day Fiance girl um, is pretending that she's getting signatures for social causes. She's like, do you support veterans? <laughs> do you support <laughs> breast cancer? <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. So, but anyways, that's what I've been watching. What TV shows have you been watching? Tell me, I gotta know. Well, Jim, I've been watching a little TV show called The Franchise, which is a satirical comedy on HBO, or I suppose maybe it's on. Max, the one to watch for HBO, as as you're fond of saying. Now, yeah. the reason I got interested in this was that it uh, came up as a show connected with the name of Armano Iannucci, who I love most of the things he's made. Um, you know, he's done... Uh, we don't need to get into all of the details, but he's made many, many amazing things. Uh, Death of Stalin, of course, Thick of It TV show, uh, many other shows, and they've always struck a really good tone of, like a black comedy type thing, uh, always writes very funny dialogue, that sort of stuff. So I was like, all right, sounds great. Because the franchise, as the name implies, is about the making of a superhero film. And it's mm. very has very little to do with what's in front of the camera. The main character, played by uh, Himesh Patel, who you might know from things like the film Yesterday, where the Beatles disappears from the world. He's the main guy in that. Um, he basically plays the first assistant director, which, you know, if you've gone to film school or know anything about this sort of thing, the or if you don't, uh, the first assistant director is the person who actually has to make the film happen to a large degree because the director is very much concerned with talking to the actors and the creative vision and all of that. And the first assistant director is the person who has to keep everything organized, make sure it's happening. It's his ass on the line. And of course, this is a real cock up of a film. So they're making a superhero film, but it's more so about the behind the scenes fuckery and drama and the the studio is a very ominous presence that probably wants to can the whole film uh maybe we'll keep it going but might switch things up and the producers get switched around and all this shit so it's kind of that type of vibe but i have to say yeah i, I got interested because it's amano yanucci but he's not the main guy he's executive producing you know ah, so they always get you with that shit <laughs> They always do. And I did read that. He, I mean, he was originally supposed to be writing the pilot and maybe he was, but he's not credited as a writer on any of the episodes. He's the executive producer. The main guy in the showrunner is John Brown, who I looked into and he doesn't have a massive um, writing career behind him. He's written a few episodes of Succession. Um, another big name that's attached to it is Sam Mendes, who has directed the first episode and is directing a few of them. Um these are all competent people, like nothing against John Brown, but I think I was just expecting a certain level of pitch black yeah. comedy. And I feel like it's a little bit toned down, maybe. I actually think it's completely competently put together. It's fairly funny. Uh, I've watched two episodes. There's only three episodes out. Third episode came out last night, so it's currently airing. Um, it's pretty good. Like you said, you wouldn't recommend uh, House of Villains unless you're into reality shows. For this one, I recommend it if you're into people making movies. You know, I was mm. t talking to my partner Una about it, and she was like, "Oh yeah, I have a real like allergic reaction to whenever writers are writing about writing and filmmakers are making films about filmmaking. It's all so up its own ass." And I'm like, "Yeah, I agree. It's so up its own ass. But I am a writer and I am a filmmaker, and that's why I like that shit, right? So I'm interested in. That's like it's not a turn off for me. Uh, it'd be more of a turn on." So I'm like, I'm into seeing all of this production stuff. It's pretty good. But I will say the the so far, the sort of takedown of superhero stuff, it's not that biting. Like what's happening in front of the camera is ridiculous. And it's kind of, they're making fun of superhero films, obviously. But I'm also like, it's not that biting. It's not, mm. it's not bad, but I'm like, it's been a while, like... It's 2024. Like, we can't just say superhero films are dumb. Wouldn't it be silly if all these actors yeah. are taking it real seriously and, and stuff? And, you know, you can detect the Iannucci influence in that there's a lot of cursing, a lot of people calling each other very creative swear words and that sort of thing. But in the end, when it comes to, like, the parodying of the films, I'd say, you know, Stephen Merchant and... and uh, 
and Ricky Gervais's extras did it better. And that's that's like 20 years ago at this stage, you know? Well, um, so yeah, here's a ahead. question. Does the boys do it better? Mm. I think the boys does do it better, yeah, so far. Mm. But I think the boys has a benefit, right? Because they're obviously in a different universe where uh, it's kind of like... Well, the the superheroes are evil and they exist in that world. There's just a more. I think that's it, right? There's more layers to it in the boys because there's you know who these people are outside of in the boys. You know how that these people are who are superheroes are playing characters and they're absolutely heinous individuals, but they're manipulated by a corporation. In this, it's basically just like two actors who are sort of bickering about who who's number one on the call sheet, you know. And they're they're you know the the superhero in the movie he has like an invisible jackhammer and he's just kind of doing like a jackhammer motion like he's drilling and that's hope supposed to make him fly away or whatever and that's kind of the extent of the joke you know it's silly mm. um they the director wants sixty moss men there in moss men costumes but they cut them for budget and I, I'm not I'm just I'm not blown away by it and I don't know if I'll keep watching it but I probably will a little bit it's not terrible but it's just it does not live up to the hype that I'd built for myself when I was like because uh, Yanucci often does like politically related stuff and he does that so well and obviously there's so much to parody in the realm of politics and like the basically showing the absolute fuckwits who are behind all the decision making that happens in our modern society there's a there's a deep well to tap there of like showing how everyone's corrupt and fucked up in different ways and how they argue and make things happen how they deal with scandals and I so far I'm not seeing that many layers to what's happening here in the franchise but with that said all the main characters are people who are interested in making films for whatever reason and it's basically just showing what a hell it is to be in the movie industry so it's making me feel better about the fact that i mainly make podcasts these days and that's if anything is is a positive yeah that could be the great lie they tell you though like oh it's not all great over here i tell you very much uh, you're actually i hate you're lucky. i hate the <laughs> i hate the advice of that writers like to say of like oh if you could do anything else oh mm. it's so much better to do anything yeah. else rather than to be a multi-millionaire like me yeah <laughs> up be some that, bullshit novels <laughs> yeah just hangs out for weeks and then it's like oh no a deadline and quickly writes something um but uh <laughs> yeah I've never seen the show, so I don't even know if this would work or not. But, like, thinking about it, like, you're mentioning, like, being more biting with the satire and, like, pointed. Uh, thinking about it, Max, you know, HBO, Max, this is Warner Brothers, this is DC. Would it be weird if they, what if they just had S Superman and Batman, but they were just directly making fun of that shit? Would that make sense? Or would that be, would that come off as too much, almost like cross promotion or something? Do you feel? Um, I think if they were able, yeah, I think it would, or it, it's kind of, again, I'm thinking of extras where, you know, there's bits where the extras was a TV show for those that don't oh, know that so came good. out. Uh, yeah. Around 20 years ago. I don't remember the exact year, but basically like they, the, the real, uh, pull in many ways was that every episode they'd have cameos from these huge actors. So you have Daniel Radcliffe appearing in sort of a fake uh, Harry Potter esque film, but he's making fu they're making fun of those films, and then the the actor is also playing a sort of parody of themselves, right? Because they're in and out of character in the show. So you see Daniel Radcliffe just being a horny teenager who has no game, and he's so funny. You know, and everyone who came on extras uh, yeah. as one of these cameo Surian, people. Surian, Surian, Surian. You <laughs> shall not pass. Surian, Surian. <laughs> it's a fucking classic. <laughs> it's okay. um, and, and, and that kind of is meta textual in the same sort of way as if these people, you know, if the people in the franchise were actually the superheroes or whatever. Yeah, I think it just something like that would add a little bit of extra depth to the franchise that I haven't seen yet after a couple of episodes for sure. Hmm. Yeah, because it is weird. I did see, like, when I heard about this show, I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. Um, I did see it in my my Max app for a second, but I just, yeah, I wasn't quite in the mood, and I hadn't heard. Like, sometimes if it's something where I'm like, I'm mildly interested in that, but I haven't gotten that extra push of, like, sometimes you'll just stumble upon people are raving about something. Like, this is so great. And I'm like, oh, it's yeah. weird. There's been a few episodes, and I feel like I haven't heard anything about it. That doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. I mean, just look at Apple TV. They have a lot of great shows. No <laughs> one talks about them. So yeah. it doesn't or always watches. mean that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
but I just didn't have that extra push to to uh, move my finger to the box and hit the button. <laughs> so yeah. there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and it's a little. I'm a little bit sad about it because yeah, you you have people like um, Richard E. Grant is in it, uh, and you know he's saying curse words, and that's kind of funny. But that's not you know Sir Ian, Sir Ian, Sir Ian from mm. from extras or a show like it. I had, hadn't even thought of the extras comparison until we started talking about it now. But I think it's a real like it shows what you can do in this space, and they are not doing that much in this space. And there's only six episodes from what I've seen, and I've watched two of them. Like so. Yeah, it's yeah. fine. It's fine. Well, it's not a strong recommendation, but it's also, it's not bad. So yeah. that's, that is also true. I mean, it's interesting for me to think about. Not that I, I'm sure the um, people making the show maybe never even entertain this idea, but like, especially with with Warner Brothers and DC already being kind of thought of as a mess, like if they were like leaning into that, people seem to really enjoy when you're self-deprecating. But then again, is that risking just putting your brand in the toilet as well. Like maybe it does come out the other side is a bad thing. It's just interesting I think to me to think about if they did something like yeah. that. Probably what they should have done is pick a real superhero because the joke in the show is kind of that this character seems to be like a real B list superhero, right? They're mm. talking about canceling this movie. It's not, it's obviously looks terrible from what we see in the show. So maybe that would have been the thing, pick a real superhero, like, you know, the guardians of the galaxy before the guardians of the galaxy was a thing, like a real obscure one that exists that they th- can get the rights to, and then have this be the TV show of that hero and sort of intersperse the plot of the thing into the thing, but it's actually about the making of it. Then there's sort of that meta layer of like, you're telling the story, but maybe the superhero is one that also also has sort of meta powers and can talk to camera like Deadpool. Now we've got yeah. an idea, Jim. Now we're fucking sure. cooking. What is this blank meets blank over here? Yeah. Well, I mean, and also, I mean, Entourage literally did that back in the day. I mean, HBO show, yeah. the whole big thing was that he was Aquaman. Um, and, you know, they even brought James Cameron to cameo and be the, the fake director of the Aquaman movie that broke records. So, it, yeah, when you're a little bit more daring with that type of stuff, I feel like it can pay off, even if it seems like you're making a mockery of yourself. People kind of eat that shit up. People enjoy that. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I guess that's that on the what we've been watching, right? Now let's get to our actual superhero <laughs> talk, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, setting aside the jokes, let's talk about a gritty reboot of The Penguin from Batman. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So yeah, what We're is is this episode five? Episode five of the Penguin? Yes, it's an eight yeah. episode miniseries. We're in episode five. We just passed the midpoint. Uh, we're going to give you a spoiler warning in a second, but like you probably should have watched the first four At episodes. Have we not yeah. told you enough times that it's a great TV show, guys? Yeah, yeah, and I mean, it, being an episode five of eight, it does totally feel like a. It is a re like. Things got all shaken up in the first four episodes. This is very much putting pieces back on the board somewhere to get them in like alignment or um, in, in I don't know in battle, if you will, for the next for the back half of the season. So it's not like a blowaway episode like some of the other ones, but it, it, but it's not bad by any means. It just does feel like okay, things are settling a bit as we're starting to see where we're headed. Um, as we head to the finale here. So, um, I mean, I guess, should we just get into spoilers? Or do you have anything to say before spoilers? Yeah, no, I mean, it's like you said, it's kind of the first four episodes were very clearly an arc. It's led to the midpoint, and I I don't think I can say it any better. They've they've reset the board, so it's kind of the, uh, the uh, things slowing down after the big climactic events of the last couple of episodes, but at the same time starting to get into gear and you can see where they're going to be going in the next few episodes and, and what that might build to. But yeah, not a mind-blowing episode for those very reasons, um, but also one that uh, shows continued promise in this being an overall very good show. So that's good. Absolutely. So now this is where we take a dance break for the spoiler jingle. Whoop. Or do we? Wait, wait there. Ayo, ayo, this is AI generated bullshit. AI generated bullshit by AI Jacob, here we go. 
Spoiler alert, we're gonna spill the beans No turning back, no living in your dreams We'll reveal secrets and we'll blow your mind Darth Vader was dead the whole time And in the sixth sense, Bruce Willis was that kid's dad Dumbledore killed Snape, made all the kids sad Man, you can't control these spoiler bars And the planet of the apes was actually Mars You know what's great? Being in your nondescript room, it almost looks like the Jamiroquai video or something. Yeah. It's well, it's the <laughs> wide-angle lens as well. Like, I can come up to the to the camera and stuff. <laughs> so we did say it was kind of like a... Uh, um, Ho-hum's not the right word we said, but, you know, we definitely underplayed an episode where two people get lit on fire and burned to death. So. <laughs> See, this is the problem. This is why The Sopranos is so good, because they yeah. don't give us any of this shit. And then when it happens, you're like, fuck, yeah. Yeah, this, yeah. This show, the pacing is very good, but the pacing is very fast as well. And uh, as you said, a few people get lit on fire, um, but that kind of almost takes the juice out of it a little bit, right? Like, if that happened, if they put that at the climax of an episode and built up to it, I feel like I would have felt more. Where it felt, it really felt like a transition episode. And even that was like, this is a transition scene because we already know the Penguins attempted to murder this other person. So we know shit's going to go down here. This guy's wet. It's definitely gasoline. If you haven't watched it, I'm pretty sure you can already piece together what I'm talking about, you know? (laughs) And, I mean, it's a nitpick, but it's like, how do you not smell that gasoline? I mean, come on. But well, it's interesting for you to say that, yeah, if this was more of a climax of an episode, because there were a couple moments in this episode where I was like, oh, this is the end. Because there was also yeah. when Sophia shoots uh, Vidi in the head, I was like, oh, this is it. This is it. But I think it still went a little bit after that, didn't it? Didn't it still keep going from there? It finishes up with them in the sewers, which was a real that's like, right. Okay, yeah, a real light bulb moment for me because I was like, I'm pretty sure the penguin hangs out in the sewers or yes. whatever. Like that's yeah. a thing, and that was like one of those where you almost get a reminder that you're watching like a superhero or supervillain show, you know. But yeah, yeah, you're right. That was a good moment. I li- that was probably my favorite moment of the episode when she kills him because I wasn't that blown away by last episode the sort of. Uh, Sophia gassing her whole family type twist because there weren't really any um, stakes there. You know, it was a very methodical, like she had a plan, she executed a plan. Uh, Given how they've built her up, I wasn't shocked that she'd murder all these people, you know, and there wasn't really any conflict in it um, as far as what I could see, you know. So she didn't face any opposition in executing that plan. So it's more interesting now and we're getting back into stuff. I was surprised that she had... uh, uh, Is it Vidi? Vito? Johnny? Vito? Yeah, Vidi. 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 Surprised that he had... That she had him, like locked up because i assumed he would be playing the role that he plays later in the episode uh but yeah i do love that she shoots him in the head that was great yeah well there's some interesting things i mean backing up towards the beginning as well um when they bust in on the maroni son but it's like oh shit vic is like now uh front and center like he's grabbing the guy off the as the guy's trying to run away and hop a fence throwing him on the ground punching him in the face and shit it's like a reminder of like, oh, yeah, Vic chose this now. He's not the same guy that's like kind of like skittish in the background of like, oh, my God, what are we doing? Uh, but I guess I got to do it. He's yeah. he's uh, more proactive, which was interesting to see. But even the uh, like tying that to the Sophia moment, like obviously we know from the end of the last episode that she's all in and we've seen her history that's made her the way she is. But th- that still comes off to me as like, a, oh, shit. Like, I keep forgetting, no, this is who she is. And now she's, like, displaying her scars and stuff like that. Uh, so there is a lot of cool things that we are, like, seeing, um, like, the ramifications of the first four episodes. But, again, like, placement setting for where we're, where we're going. Um, and then I, I was reading up a little bit, a small detail, because I don't know a lot about, like, the Batman street villains. Like, I'm, I'm, familiar, I'm vaguely familiar that the Falcone family is always, like, mentioned, whether it be in, mm-hmm. like, the Dark Knight or even, of course, the Batman movie. But uh, reading up on, like, the, the Gigante family, it is, it seems, it, they did a, their own little twist on it. Because I guess technically, yeah, Sophia Falcone 
is part of the Gigante family in the comics, but she marries into that family. But they just kind of, you know, streamlined it a bit and just made it more her maiden name and honoring her mother, which I think it's like a small example of like smart, efficient writing, I feel. Like, oh, that's kind yeah. of a cool way. It doesn't really mean anything at all if you're just watching the show. But if I was more into, like, I love Batman, but again, I don't know a lot of this, like, the mafia side of Batman's story. Um, if you're into that stuff, that's like that's a cool way to handle some of that shit without it being like this weird, you know, um, distracting Easter egg. You know what I mean? I just thought that was like it just shows they've done a lot of smart things as writers. And I thought that was a cool little thing reading up on it um, on one of the choices they made. Yeah. And as you said, it doesn't really mean anything, but it shows how she's sort of. I mean, she's literally destroyed that family, but now she's like remaking it. So uh, if you haven't seen it and you're just listening to us recap it for some reason, um, like she uh, she's killed everyone in the Falcone family, right? And then she she talks to the people who are like, you guys were never made men. You guys are the underlings. And it's interesting because obviously Oz is doing the exact same thing on his end. They're both, mm. because so many people have been killed and because the family's sort of splitting, they have to kind of... Uh, energize their workforce uh, by uh, with blood money <laughs> and promises. <laughs> and that's what they're both doing in this episode. So uh, sticking with Sophia, yeah, she has uh, Johnny Vitti tied up in the basement. And I guess, yeah, he tells him, her some stuff about uh, her mother was going to be running away. And like maybe that's why her dad killed him. Um, her dad killed her and everything, uh, all that stuff. But it's interesting, yeah, he says, like, oh, you're going to... Because I said last week, like, she needs him to kind of keep the organization working and kind of get yeah. the people up and, you know, do all this shit. And that's his argument as well. He says, I can give you... I can get you respect. And it's interesting because she's obviously like, yes, you can do that by me shooting you in the head in front of everyone else, which yes. is which is how what she yeah. does and throws a bunch of money to all these people who were lower down on the, down on the rung. It's basically a restructure, a reorg where she's like, yeah, guess what? You're all, a lot of people have been laid off. Technically that means you're all promoted now. Yeah. You're all managers. <laughs> so and yeah, it's, so it's, it works. It's almost too much cuz it is literal blood money like she dumps all the money in the yeah. pool of blood from <laughs> from uh, VD being shot in the head, but it works and it's still a great visual of them just like all grabbing at the money and it's just getting doused in the blood. Like it's still, and the camera is like pulling back. Like I get it. It's, it's kind of obvious and on the nose, but sometimes obvious and on the nose, y you got to just go for it because it just says, it says so much. Um, but also, yeah, going back, it is like we're seeing Oz more, I guess uh, on uh, the the down and out in this episode between yeah. you know he's got Vic like we see that like I guess in in a ways I'm sure we could make a video essay about the dismantling of the car and what that represents you know <laughs> what does that represent uh, to Oz and his stature in currently in Gotham but can he rebuild can he get that nicer car that he keeps springing up about uh, with the I think he I forget the gangster's name but I think he mentions them again in this episode. When he's talking to Vic, he's talking about that, you know, that smooth gangster that he would look up to and see driving down his block. And he felt important just by seeing him drive down his block. Um, You're talking about Rex Calabrese? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, but, yeah, so we see the dismantling of the car, his flashy purple Maserati or whatever it is. But we're also seeing that he's kind of from for the maybe not the first time. But the first time that it felt dangerous that he's more behind everyone else. Like before, we've seen yeah. him like, like uh, I guess, violent, uh, not violent, uh, uncut gemsing it where he's like rushing around making things work, but it felt more like in control. This felt a little bit more haphazard as he's still trying to, you know, uh, uh, grab at threads, even, even literally grabbing at mushrooms that are crumbling in his hands because they got all, his stash of drugs got all fucked up. Yeah, see, we were talking about him setting the, the that kid on fire when he. So basically, he's uh, doing like a whole uh, hostage situation in the first half of the episode where he gets uh, the Maroni kid. Yeah, um, Maroni, and is yeah. is giving him back uh, for the mushrooms that are the new cool drug that are supposedly going to bring all this power. Um, 
and it's funny that the uh, the them two characters getting set on fire is not the most dramatic thing that happens in that scene. I'm talking about drama in this sort of original sense of the word of like things changing, right? Because they set them on fire. That's not the thing that matters. The fire causes the uh, fire alarm <laughs> yeah. system to go off and sort of uh, fire extinguishers go off and that's what destroys the mushrooms. And the midpoint of the episode, if you're looking at it structurally, isn't the scene with the fucking um, you know, hostage situation and the gunfight. It's when all the mushrooms are fucked. And that's up until yeah. that point in the episode. He, This is the video essay. Up until that point <laughs> in the episode, uh, Oz is fully in control still because he's chatting to Vic, but he's talking to his guys he's got a plan he's doing the plan but then all the mushrooms are fucked and the kid the guy he was trying to get killed in in jail the leader yes, of the moroni yeah. family he's f- actually survived and is out so not only does he have sophia to deal with he still has his other crime family and he's now given them common cause because they both hate him more than they hate each other so that's kind of the point where we start going into like oh shit's really coming apart for him for him He's talking to Vic on the phone and he doesn't know what to do. And Vic's like, all right, I got it. I'll figure it out. I'll call you back, which is like what we wanted, what he, what he has explicitly wanted to see from Vic uh, on his performance review. Uh, and he's <laughs> actually getting it now, you know, and, yeah. and that's good. We're halfway through the show. Vic has transformed. He's punching people. He's figuring out his own solutions. So that's good. Um so yeah, that's kind of where things start to go awry at, for Oz, like truly go wrong. And you know, his his girlfriend doesn't want to come with him to stay in the slums or whatever. That's bad too. And you know, his mother, mm-hmm. uh, Vic lies to her and says like Oz has figured it all out, but actually, no, everything's fucked. You need to go and hide now in this building with no electricity on all this stuff. And he's literally. Oz is literally back where he started, right? Like, he's as deep in the dumps as Vic was uh, before he was taken under Oz's wing. So, yeah. I mean, structurally, it all makes sense. But th- I think that's why the action sequences don't matter that much. I mean, the where the hostage is taken, we see the action literally out of focus in the background. And visually, that's always a cool thing to do. But it's also literally the case that the... Uh, or it's literally out of focus but it's figuratively out of focus as well the action isn't the most important part it's the way these pieces start to come together and or rather fall apart oh yeah you like in the beginning when they kidnap um maroney yeah yeah i've just been like figuratively the action is also out of focus later on in the episode you know yeah um well yeah and uh when it comes up with the uh well also because going back to it to speak to like the um like the tempo of this show like in some respects it can be almost too quick because yeah if it was a show like the sopranos which it may be unfair to keep comparing it to but if it did have a little bit more like we would spend more time with the idea of like you know we've kind of grown to really be on Vic's side over four episodes but then we see him kind of delight in lighting a a, a a man and his mother on fire, which is wild. Like no, Vic, is, Vic isn't there for that. I'm so, not Vic. I'm I mean Oz. My Oz. Fault. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now I misspoke. I'm talking about Oz. So like, even though we know Oz is the villain, we also know he's the penguin. We know what he's supposed to be or what he is in comic book lore. But like, we've grown over these episodes to kind of root for him. I guess in a Tony Soprano situation, you know, very similar to how in. The Sopranos, although maybe that was episode five as well, where we do see Tony um, strangle a, a, a man who's in uh, witness protection. You know what I mean? Like we see him murder yeah. a guy with his bare hands. And in this, we see Oz like toss the Zippo light. Like we know he's we, we're looking at this guy drenched and we're like, this guy's drenched in gas. So <laughs> what's yeah. going on here? <laughs> Is he just going to use that as a threat? No, like the first chance he gets, he tosses it down. And uh, it is like I, I was almost going to say funny. I guess it's not funny. I, it's just funny that the mother also like gets engulfed in flames as well. Like they're literally like burnt to a crisp within minutes. Um, and we do get to hang on Oz a bit and see like the fire reflecting in his eyes and lighting his face and stuff. And he's getting off on it. I, I guess what my read from it is like he's he's taking pleasure in that. And it's a it's a reminder of like, oh, yeah, this guy is a fucking villain. Because I remember last week, I'm like, Batman can't help Vic. 
Oz has to help Vic. And now yeah. I'm like, uh-oh, maybe, um, <laughs> maybe Oz can't help. Maybe Oz shouldn't help Vic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, you're, you're right about the pacing. I think, you know, it's very rare that I'm like, ah, oh, I wish there were more episodes of this show. Uh, you know, I, uh, or rather, like, sometimes I wish there were more episodes, but that there's just more story after the season, right? We talked about this mm-hmm. with uh, House of the Dragon season two, which ends and you're like, I feel like there should be two more episodes to really wrap this one up. But you wouldn't change the pacing before this. For this one, it's eight episodes. I don't think it would have been, would have suffered from being ten episodes and just yeah. spacing things out a bit more. Now, you know, it's easy to, uh, you know, Say be a backseat now, yeah. driver over here or whatever. It works the way it is. So probably don't touch it, right? You're probably just yeah. going to fuck it up. But it does feel a bit like that because, as I said, it's the middle of the episode that things are actually falling apart for uh, for Oz. And, yeah, he has a couple of scenes. He's getting He gets into bed with his mother. That's kind of a weird scene. Um, mm. he, he's, he's his prostitute girlfriend uh, or dancer girlfriend. Sorry. I don't know. I don't know what the exact setup is. But she I doesn't want to come with him. Prostitute. Yeah. Um, the, and the way know, they things, play things that... Generally Sorry, go I'm ahead. sorry. I mean to cut you off. I was gonna say the way they play that is interesting because I I don't know if it was supposed to kind of mirror like his relationship with his mom. I know that's obviously a classic writing thing to be like, you know, the way you your your spouse can play you like your mom plays you like or meant not play you. That's the wrong word. But like, uh, because it's like he is hurt almost that he's being left behind, but she still kind of gives him that like weird pep top a, a pep talk of being like you're going to get back in this. Like, you're, even though I don't think she, I don't believe her when she's saying, like, I don't think she believes that, but they have that weird shot under the glass table. And I'm like, are they setting something? Like, is he going to, is he going to set her on fire? <laughs> like, what yeah. is going on? Like, uh, but it works kind of, I guess it just works on Oz. That's, that's how it, like it gets to him. You got to kind of stroke his ego a bit more and just tell him he's going to be big and bad and powerful, which he is. Yeah, yeah, that scene, um, uh, Una was my partner, was there and uh, was like, Oh, is, is he gonna kill her? Uh, yeah, which is exactly what you said. And I was like, Not yet, <laughs> <laughs> not yet. Wait a couple yeah. episodes, maybe. maybe we might see yeah. that as he if he has to, you know, exercise all of his uh, um, humanity by killing Vic and his girlfriend. We'll see if they both get the chop or just Vic. But anyway, uh, yeah, no, it definitely mirrors it a bit, right? Because the scenes are in sequence. But what I was going to get to is like, as far as the pacing, it's the middle of the episode. Things really are going wrong for Oz. By the end, things are starting to look up. He has a sewage yeah. system. We can kind of see the path and that's fine. But it also feels like that would have been a whole episode in, a, in many other shows. True. And then even though going back to Vic... We see that he is this more capable kind of active participant as Oz's right hand man. But when he gets a glimpse of his past in like his old street, I don't know know if I necessarily remember him as like a bully, but like just kind of like the street tough from his neighborhood, we see kind of the old Vic again. Like he's and 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 you know, we get a glimpse that that guy does see him, so we know there's gonna be something that plays out there. Um, but I did like seeing that of like a kind of quick reminder of like, well, Vic still, he still has that Vic in him. Um, and then they hint at, they don't get fully into, I would hope we're not going to have a flashback episode about what happened to his brothers, but they, they, you know, they mentioned that like, you mean Oz's brothers, right? Yeah. 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 Oz's brothers. I'm sorry. I keep jumping back and forth. I mean, we do kind of mention that, you know, Oz and his family did like live in this same area, like came up where Vic came up. Um, and they do allude a lot to what happened, what potentially happened with his brothers. Like the mother even says, like, you bring me here to like rub my face, um, like something there. I mean, it's always, it's been a thing over, like over their relationship the whole time. And it also does in a way, give him that, uh, that little push he needs when he, finds the coin and is reminded of the the underground trolleys and the sewer system and all that so he is he's found his way home and you know it it, it looks to, to, to be setting him up for success about oz's brothers i um i like i mean i would prefer if we don't find out what it is and i feel like yeah. the way you watch it would kind of 
depend like because some people will see that hint of some, something like they and he uh, Vic asks Oz what happened to his brothers and he just says like the city took them and I'm like that's yeah. evocative enough that's enough don't do a flashback episode just yeah. like you're saying it feels like that should be enough because I agree what the main villain's going to be Sophia anyway. What are we going to set up some other way that if his brothers died? Unless the only thing that's kind of left to explore really is, um, well, not the only thing that's left to explore, but the only thing in that area that we might need more information on is his relationship with his mother and how mm. she has sort of become who she is. I don't need a full flashback episode for it, but maybe there's something that Oz doesn't know about what happened, that it was actually her fault or something like that. That could certainly happen. But uh, yeah, no, it's, you get it you know like yeah. we, you can use that short use use the shorthand and i think the show uses shorthand in very effectively in general where it just kind of as we said sometimes in another show there'd be like three scenes for a thing and uh they do it in one scene and that's good i just think maybe sometimes it should be two scenes you know sure yeah no, i agree with that um and then i mean the other like plot point major plot point that happens is the sophia does use her her same skills in getting like uh, the underlings to back her in the new uh, Gigante family is she does find Maroni and kind of uh, uses, like you mentioned, their, their hatred for Oz to kind of form the families together and be like this unstoppable force whose main, main uh, goal is to basically kill Oz. Like it's not about like, we got to get the drug or anything like that. It's like, no, we need to get Oz, and we got to kill this motherfucker. I mean, he killed my brother. He killed uh, your wife and son. So yeah. now we got to get him. <laughs> it really it's, it's finally like the spinning plates are coming crashing down, which is great. Um, uh, only last thing on the whole episode. What, what's going on with Sophia's uh, psychiatrist anyway? Like, oh, we yeah. always knew it was, We always knew it was a weirdo creep. It's the only part of the show, really, that I'm like... Okay, th maybe there's too much shorthand or whatever, because like he's a weirdo. Uh, he's a psychiatrist. He worked at, at Arkham. He do he's still her psychiatrist when she comes out and does some weird laser therapy with her or whatever. And he just shows up and is like, "I want to be part of your murder empire." And I'm like, "Okay, you clearly like have the hots for her and everything, but like, what is the point of you? Like, where are you? Where I I'm honestly just interested. Like, where is this supposed to go in the story? Like, does she kill him? Does he have some sort of hypnosis powers that are going to be relevant? Like, he feels kind of like a supervillain sidekick, but on a surface level, whereas a, a lot of other characters are very fleshed out. Yes, and his his thing is the is like the main thing that has no clarity." But in, when you're doing a show like this, this is what opens up all these theories. Because, yes, there is a strong theory that he's Scarecrow, um, which I guess I could see them doing, but I don't know. I mean, because Matt Reeves is like, usually when you do a show like this, the guy making the movies isn't really involved. And I don't know. I'm not saying he's like super involved, but he's involved enough to pop up in the post-show discussions where he's there when they're talking about the episodes, he's he's speaking at least to the characters a bit and what, what their major arcs are and not like how it relates to them. So at least he's involved in that level. Usually they're not really involved at all. Their name might be a producer, but they're not doing anything. So there has always been thought that the sequel to The Batman may have the Scarecrow in it. Um, mm. So people are wondering. Because it would almost track, or if he is some... It, <clears throat> Like you mentioned, villain sidekick. It it would seem at the very least he's going to be revealed as even if it's like a C tiered Batman villain because they're being way too mysterious. But the problem with that is then if it if it's like a Wandavision situation where it turns out to be nothing like that, you're gonna let people down. I don't think it would hurt mm. the show because the show's good enough that doesn't need that. But I could see people being disappointed if this doesn't end up being a big like you know batman reveal with this guy yeah i guess that theory makes sense right i would you know i've i've seen a lot of batman shit but i don't have it all in my in the back of my head and i was just like okay scarecrow yeah i mean he's a psychology professor and he uses gas to turn people crazy you know and see, mm -hmm. see their fears or whatever so i'm like yeah i guess it makes sense i just have no 
I, I, it's just like one of the, he's like the least interesting character in the show, kind of. True. So that's the only yeah. problem with making him like he's gonna be the big bad guy in another Batman film. I'll be like. Oh, like I would. What after this? I would want more stuff with Sophia, more stuff with the Penguin. I don't give a fuck about True. this guy. But I guess it makes sense because it'd be one of those like he's in it, but it's kind of we reveal at the end he's Robin or whatever, you know? It's <laughs> yeah, a smaller well, it's, part. <laughs> it's similar to what you were talking about of like, oh yeah, like the Penguin does stuff in sewers. Like y- you almost you think of that stuff as an afterthought because you forget you're watching a Penguin show. Like, but yeah. that's that's why it's good though. That's why we love it at least. I mean, I do like that it's the penguin also, but I like that it doesn't matter that it's the penguin. Like, it still yeah. works either way. So, I think that's it's a kind of. I mean, it, I I'd say this is a pretty credible theory though, even though I don't love it because like even even like the inmate she killed in the last episode was called yeah. Magpie, which is like a DC villain or whatever, right? So, mm-hmm. how could he not be? A character that we know and how could that not be a reveal you stick in towards the end you know although uh, to be fair right. to go to go to while well, the wandavision's completely different company like when they brought that kid that was quicksilver in the x-men movies i was like how can he not be quicksilver <laughs> and then he wasn't he was like dick boner was his name it was a dick joke in the end <laughs> <laughs> it was one of the oh. worst things i've ever seen <laughs> well, we we will have to wait and see. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I hope you're enjoying um, the Penguin as much as we are. Uh, let us know. You can hit us up at shows which you know show at gmail dot com. If you uh, are watching on YouTube, drop us a like and a comment. And if you're listening on the podcast, uh, rate and subscribe and tell a friend. Yeah, let us Anything know what shows we should be watching. Um, check us out on TikTok at Shows What You Know, where we post yes. little clips from uh, from the episodes, and you know, share those or whatever if you want. And uh, yeah, just keep watching TV. Watch, catch up on Cobra Kai. It's coming up, man. Just a few weeks. Yeah, get ready. Oh, get ready. And for there's Friday a Kid there's Legend. a t- th- there's a TV show coming out called Yakuza ba- or Like a Dragon. Yeah, it's coming up this week. Watch that. It's gonna be great. <laughs> oh, is that this week? It's based on the game, right? Yeah, it's coming out this week. I'm going to tell you all about it next week, man. (laughs) Sweet. All right. Thanks, everybody. We uh, are shows what you know. We'll always watch TV. And if you think we can't, we'll watch more and you'll see. That's why the people of the web believe in Jim from Las Vegas, Sam, Jacob from Sweden.